The second panel is about this uh, uh, practice that today is becoming more and more usual of uh, small offices working abroad. Uh, we could say then that transnational practice of emerging offices is transforming the classical idea of international architecture or architecture for sport because these small offices are being able to create an, a very sensible and, and engaged relation with the context uh, they work, very different from the context where they work from. And, and this dialogue is, is really uh, important and, and necessary. So the question is not how to export architecture, that perhaps was the problem 20 or 30 years ago, but how, we, um, how can we be local in many places? How to bring to the locals a new reading of any environment we work in? So this uh, idea of being a foreigner and showing the locals uh, invisible values of the context they live in is the essence of this second panel. Samuel Barclay and uh, Anne Jinen are the principals of case design. They could be part of several of the groups today, uh, but we have uh, uh, selected them from this uh, discussion about from local to transnational. They are based in, in Mumbai, India, and they respond to contextual conditions working with mark makers, artists, and technicians in South Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Fumika Simbura and Iko Kobayashi are terrain architects. Some of their projects are in Indonesia or Africa and are produced from, for very needed, needed communities, making scarcity virtue and working with very local skills, materialities, and climate conditions. They also teach in, in Japan. Ingrid Moye and Christoph Seller are based in Mexico City and Berlin, working in Mexico, Europe, Kurdistan, Iraq, and so on, and also teaching in different cities like London at the AA or Mexico Universidad Iberoamericana, and they are one of these, um, the third um, office, in the, the, the third practice for this panel. The moderator will be uh, our Dean Amalan Rouse, inspiring of the idea of global thinking that founds this symposium, whose book We'll get there when we cross that bridge. Launched yesterday, tells the story of the flexibility of her office to understand different geographical contexts and social environments. So enjoy the panel and let us uh, come to the front to Samuel and, and where are you? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I went to school, undergrad, not too far from here, and uh, always came to Columbia for a lot of these symposiums and lectures, so it's a great honor to be here. We appreciate it. Uh, Anna and I started working together about four years ago, uh, and we both come from uh, backgrounds where we were sort of very fascinated uh, in making, in, in craft and workmanship. Uh, I grew up in, in my grandfather's workshops, uh, where we were always doing sort of very different kinds of projects. Anna uh, was sort of raised in a house that was being built as, as they lived in it. And so for us, uh, the way that things come together and, and how they're uh, assembled and the people who are making them is, is really critical to the way that we've always thought about our work. Uh, so the idea of who makes it the idea of where is it made, and uh, then of course, what is it made of. Uh, we found, sorry, mm, yeah, maybe I should lean, lean forward. Um, we found ourselves uh, in India. Uh, I went there as part of uh, graduate studies and sort of fell in love with the place and the way that things were made, uh, the collaborations that you could uh, have with craftsmen, uh, Doing, doing the the work that you're conceiving of, but also engaging with them conversationally to develop something uh, incredibly rich. 
this is uh, an image of a, a brick kiln. So the, the, the sort of race course around the outside are the, are the bricks uh, that have been made to put the, this, the space together. But what's always fascinated us uh, is the sort of primitive nature that is still available in building technology. We can build the way we did 2,000 years ago, but at the same time we can build in, in pretty sophisticated ways. Despite the sort of primitive materials that are there, uh, the artisans and craftspeople, again, that we work with are incredibly sophisticated. They're, they are able to work with very, very detailed uh, and precise uh, materials. And out of that, we are able to engage with them in dialogues uh, to sort of produce things that I just think wouldn't be possible in other contexts. So these are a series of door handles that we sort of take through sketch, through uh, prototype. These are wooden, wooden samples on the bottom left that then get turned into brass, that then get put on a door, and then eventually go into production. Uh, and so for us, this is such a treat to be able to engage with them again and create something that is not merely our vision, but also is a conversation that evolves through comfort and preg pragmatism and hopefully elegance and beauty. Um, we also have a collection uh, of sort of furniture and lights, uh, things again that we've developed primarily out of projects. This has been a sort of organic offshoot of our, of our architecture practice. Um, most of these have developed specifically for projects, but a lot of times they're simply a sketch that gets made, an idea, a conversation, a reference that we pick up. Uh, so a lot of what we try and do is, is also based on observation and then sort of following that up uh, with the sort of intuition of how to take that, that observation that we've uh, sort of looked at and translate that into something that is physical and practical and simple and hopefully, again, beautiful. And in uh, all of our architecture projects or interior projects or even the furniture, we work very closely with uh, these craftsmen. And they're not, well, part of it is that they're the people who build it or make it, but they're also become very much part of the design process. And we, we always, like for most of our projects, we start construction even before the whole project is designed. Like as soon as there is enough to start, we start. And like we uh, really try to leave a lot of things open to be able to make the decision uh, when the time is appropriate. And uh, this project, for example, was a small cafe in Dubai, but we constructed it and built it entirely in India in a workshop of our carpenters that we work with, and we came into the workshop with a sort of conceptual idea and a sort of gen general design, but the whole design was developed through collaboration with these carpenters, like all the details, all the, how the construction works, it was really a co collaborative effort. And um, at the same time, we also make a lot of models that for us is a tool to not only understand the design and work on the design, for ourselves and within our team and in our studio, but it also becomes a tool to communicate ideas, whether that's with a client, uh, but very often also with people on site. Like all of our models always get a little dirty because we used to, we, we always bring them to, uh, to the site and uh, we use them for, yeah, in very different ways. And uh, for example, the one, the model on the right is much more refined and detailed and really tries to communicate the, the intentions that we have, and the one on the left is a quick model made from the earth on construction sites that just tries to quickly um, understand and talk about ideas with, with the uh, construction people on site. And um, what makes our practice in India and in like all the projects throughout the world that we work on um, maybe different from the lot of practices that both of us come from, from Europe and the US, is the way 
um, drawings and models play a role through that design process and what's what we always try to do, we, d we don't see a drawing as a, as a document that's, that's fixed or that's, um, that's static and it becomes very much a, a tool to start a dialogue. And um, instead of these thick packs of papers, of construction documents, we, we try to make as less drawings as possible and a lot of our drawings are also made on site. And these two, these two images uh, are, the drawings are actually made by the people, like the people holding the pens are the people who are constructing the buildings. So they really become part of that design uh, dialogue and that collaborative effort of creating uh, the buildings. And apart from that, from that design process, the way materials play a role in our practice is also very uh, important. And that's the part where what it is, what is it made of? And that's of course very much related to this craftsmanship and these artisans who build it, and also the availability of materials in a lot of the places where where we build. Um, the image on the right is a is a mock-up for a school that we're building in India, and the use of a very cheap marble was in this case. Uh, less expensive than simple plywood cupboards for, for uh, storage. And just that discovery and that way of thinking is um, uh, for us can only happen because we collaborate with the people who build it and because we, we go to the places where these materials are uh, coming from. This is uh, an image of that same school, and the the photograph on the top left, as you guys might recognize, are Picciones paving for the steps to the Acropolis. It's the photograph, I literally pulled out my phone, I showed it to our head mason, I said, this is what we want, how do we get it for next to nothing? So we began this conversation, and the image on the bottom left and the paving you see on the right is basically, they would go to stone shops and take all the offcuts, right? And so, literally the shops would try and get rid of it because normally they had to pay somebody to truck and take it away. So if we backed up with, with our truck, brought them to site, all we were, we were getting the material effectively for free. And it's just a little bit more investment in the craftsmanship and the time and energy and effort to, to lay it down. But again, it's a detail that there's no drawing of this anywhere. Uh, even the, the, the lines on the ground of how it's laid out and the patterns are all just marked in chalk. Uh, as a full-scale drawing. And we do make drawings in our studio, but we also, uh, very often, especially when it comes more to the details, um, the architects and designers in our studio make a lot of models. And from, But very quickly in this process, we engage the people who make it. And then we start making mock-ups to understand details or the way it's constructed. And through that process, we come to the, to the final design. And it's not, for us, it's to, to be local, uh, to be uh, relevant for the place that, where we are constructing something doesn't always mean that we engage with uh, local craftsmen or uh, people who are constructing it. We also try to pull in collaborators from other parts of the world whose uh, view or opinion we think is relevant for the specific project. And for example, it is, this is the same school and you see all these colored um, chimneys on top of the buildings. They are uh, solar chimneys. Uh, the whole building is uh, Passive, passively cooled, and we developed that uh, system with together with the climate engineers of TransSolar, who are based here in New York. So that was, but they've they've modeled with a digital model. They uh, modeled the whole school and developed the system with us, which was very specific for this valley where the school was built in India. We've also collaborated with, uh, this is a friend of ours from Copenhagen. She's a visual artist who does a lot of work with color. So she was, you know, just sent me a, a message one day, I'm thinking of coming to India, is there anything that I can work on? So within, you know, one or two days we were on Skype, another one or two days later she had her plane tickets and she came and using natural pigments, uh, PVA, effectively Elmer's glue and a mixture of lime and cement, she developed all of these colors 
for the school, which just adds uh, a whole nother layer that we would not have been able to achieve with, you know, with our, I'll say, limited knowledge. But it was really a valuable lesson for us that wherever we can sort of draw in these people who sort of share our values and our, and our not just our vision, but just what we aspire to achieve in, in a place or in a context, Anytime somebody who shares that and has that expertise, we want to try and grab them and, and bring them on board. Um, we also uh, started working on a project which is not in India, but in Zanzibar in Africa, where the presence of craftsmanship and like, of course the distance between our studio and building there is very different than the projects we've been doing in India so far. And uh, that's, but the way we've worked on it on it is quite similar. We again used a lot of models to not only understand and develop the design within our studio, um, but also to have that model as a, as a document to communicate with the people on site. These are some images again of, of sort of where the materials are coming from, how they're quarried. We jumped on a flight with the clients, flew over to the mainland, looked, uh, sort of went up into the hills and found the places where, where the stone that we wanted to use would come from. So for, a guest, uh, for us, again, the understanding of, of where the material's from, how is it processed, who's gonna lay it down, and then really investing and engaging with those people to put it down in a sort of careful and thoughtful way. That sort of trust deficit that is naturally there between, I think, designers and builders is something that we work really, really hard to, to overcome. And to achieve that engagement, for us it's very important, and we do this with every project, is to have a site architect, a person who is full-time present on site, who's not only uh, communicating and sort of bridging the gap between what we've thought about and what the builders are building, but also can respond to that in a very intuitive and very quick and open way. So for the, the project here in Zanzibar, we have an Italian architect who worked in our office, who now lives uh, in Zanzibar and is uh, like working with these, uh, these people. And he can really, it's, it makes such a difference to, of being present there every day and being able to establish these relationships to understand which of the builders is good in certain uh, building certain parts and like trying to direct that, but also to have them uh, be part of, of the problem solving that needs to happen on site and to have their knowledge and their expertise brought into the project. This image on the right is, is the client uh, standing against the wall and, and the gentleman on the right is a permaculturalist who's based in Zanzibar. He's from Germany, he's trained as a chef, his wife is from the Philippines and they've just come to this island and sort of developed this, uh, it's a school, they're developing a large residential compound uh, and they're really advising us on what kind of worms we need to propagate, how we build biomass so that we can construct soil. The entire site is, is basically just covered with rock at the moment. And so we're literally growing a farm. We cannot bring in soil, it's, it just is cost prohibitive. So we're putting in things like papayas and bananas that you, you sort of grow it, cut it down, create the mulch to uh, establish that, uh, that fertile ground. The image on the left is a drawing made by our landscape designer who's a friend of mine who works out of New Zealand. I had made some gardens with him in the south of India. And so again, it's just finding these people who can add value and add input, but really sort of share, share our values. Um, the third project that we're quickly showing a little bit of is a project that uh, we started about a year ago in Bali. It's not, the construction will, like the actual construction will start uh, in a couple of months, but our presence on site has already been established. We've built the full design 
uh, as a one-to-one uh, mock-up on site uh, in bamboo, just to sort of have the frame the frames of the buildings uh, present on site. And partly that was because the the site, the topography is quite steep and quite irregular. So it was for us uh, a method to understand where trees are growing or how the slope, where we need to cut or where we can shift some buildings to to have that work better. But it was also a way to for the clients to to understand the design, but also the structural engineer who we met on site for the first time standing in this bamboo mock-up and we could work together with him to resolve some of the structural issues. And we did, we built this with a, a group of local uh, farmers who were able to help us uh, build these bamboo structures. And for us, that presence is also very important, that we established that relationship with the people who are from, from around where we are building. And we are the foreigners coming in and sort of ruining their peaceful village. But instead of doing that, we try to engage them and um, have their input also in, in the project. And this is a, a photo of our small workshop in, in Mumbai. You can imagine it's a uh, space is at a premium in a city of 22 million people. Uh, and I think what, you know, as Anna touched on earlier, what, what we really try and do is, is create, as designers, to create objects, artifacts, drawings, sketches that try and illustrate our ideas, but that really facilitate a dialogue. They're not explicit sets of instructions. They are things that are prompts, whether it's with the client or the builders or whoever it is. And then to try and create a space where these things can, uh, can exist uh, in, our, in our presence, whether it's on site or in our own space. And then to the, the idea of uh, practice and intentionality, which I just wanted to very briefly touch on is, we, we, we've really thought about that, uh, I think in a lot of ways, the way we think about our projects, as Anna mentioned, that we most of the time start before we really know where we're going. We have a sense for it, there's a framework, there's some really basic drawings or sketches, but we really try and sort of jump into that. And then as the context evolves and as we have all of the, the sort of parts in place to make the decision that we need to, uh, we try and then pull the trigger and, and execute that. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the front. Terrain Architects from... Where are you? Ah, okay. <laughs> Terrain Architects from Japan, we can you. Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Iko, and this is Fumi. Uh, we are co-founders of the Terrain Architects, uh, which is a Tokyo-based firm established in 2011. Uh, we are currently working on the project in Japan and Uganda in Africa. So for us, the definition of transnational is being balanced in relations between respecting the local people and maintaining our identity. Uh, local, sorry, the local identity and uh, maintaining our identity. So we are going to talk about how we have designed the six years of our practice. So both of us were born raised and educated in Japan. So Fumi left Japan in 2006 after graduation and spent one year in Ireland working for Boyd Cody Architects and traveled many countries and a couple of places in Africa. And I left Japan during my studies and lived in Uganda for one year and also lived in Mali for a year. And I came back to Japan to finish my master course. I think it is one of the reasons why each of us trouble not to see a sort of famous architects designed by superstar architects, but to see more about local, usual architecture respecting the people's lives. 
The picture shows the village where I stayed for a year in Mali. So it is called Teli village of the Dogon. I was much interested in how people live in the village and how these houses are built by the local people. To know that, I stayed with the local people and tried to measure and record their houses. So we met first time on the survey trip in China in 2004 when we were a master course student. It was for the measurement survey of Hakka housing. We are both excited to see like an architecture representing uh, the, the context directory. We share, we, we share our interest in architecture without architects. Uh, year 2010 was a pivotal year for us. A Japanese lady had an idea to build a small library in a remote village in Indonesia. And she had an interest in our unusual experience abroad. Then she asked us to design and supervise the construct its construction. Uh, this project is a reason we decided to work with us uh, as a team. It is an important project for us that we learn how to be involved in different contexts as architects, though the success and the errors of this project. At that time, Fumi was working as a research associate at the university, and I was working for a firm. We asked the client to give us as many opportunities as possible to visit the site instead of an amount of the money. So we didn't have any idea how much was the proper fee when architects design an architecture abroad. We visited the site, carefully observed it and its surroundings, and also uh, collected information as much as possible. In different contexts, we found some similarities in the lives of the local people and our familiar custom, like eating, sitting, and sleeping on the floor. For us, usually use tatami mat, we call it floor intimacy. So this is the concept drawing. These are many small steps under one simple roof. So we try to develop an idea by this our cultural similarity for the project. So of course, using local materials and local labors were crucial. We can't access easily to this remote village. It should be, it should be maintained by the local people. So we try to achieve our idea while using local materials and labors. Then construction started. Many difficulties appeared. So one of them is about people. So there are so many misunderstandings with people who are involved in the project, like translator, contractor, and so on. So as a consequence, we lost extra time, energy, and money. So another one is in <coughs> excuse me, the communication. The picture shows its construction. So uh, there was an internet communication too, like Skype in 2010, but it was not widely used. So it was hard to get in, uh, timely information, though it was quite important. So we learned organizing a good team was quite important. So these pictures show library after completion. Though there were so many challenges for us, we think that the idea of our design was simple enough to transfer to local builders and uh, uh, attractive enough to children to maximize, maximize their ability to play with steps and flow. On reflection of uh, the experience in Indonesia, when we got the opportunity to design and supervise a dormitory project in Uganda, we decided to put more time on this project. At that time, Fumi finished the full-time contract at the university and uh, she encouraged me to quit a farm for this project. So it was because we wanted to de dedicate our time, energy, and passion to this exciting project. So we established our farm in 2011. 
So I had experience living there for a year in 2003. So we thought that was also an advantage for us. So uh, there was not so much research except general information about architecture. We carefully collected the useful information which is reliable for finding what is possible on site. So we decided to deeply integrate uh, ourselves into the local lifestyle. We are eating local food, speaking local language as much as possible, uh, dancing with them, arguing with them, and so on. Of course, there are some difficulties that we don't experience in, Japan, in Tokyo, like frequent blackout, terrible traffic jam, and unpunctual people. But we could adapt and we felt comfortable in their culture, climate, and custom. So I, I visited there for the first time it's in 2011. And I also like to live there. So as we, decide, as we had decided, we spent much time there on the reflection of the experience in Indonesia. But new problems emerged because we spent too much time there we had got too close. We lost our outsider's view. So we realized it when we thought about problems, like um, because it is a dangerous place with many burglars, let's make boundary walls high. Or because there is strong sunlight and some heavy rain, let's close the building. So those were locally minded solutions in a bad way, I think. But things changed when I came back to Japan and I drew this drawing for some uh, architecture exhibition. Um, it represents a few things. So one is the strong contrast of sunlight and shade. And uh, another is the seamless connection between inside and outside. And the people can walk through in and out of the shade along the walls. So what this drawing highlights is its climate <coughs> and its brick walls. Both are too usual for local people. So what we, we have done is, I think, is extraction of the elements of the site, or I can say selection, rejection, pruning, and cleansing to see the essentials with an outsider's view. And a little more about brick walls, one essential thing that we focused on. So local people take them for granted, recognizing them as cheap materials. However, we recognize them simply as beautiful regional elements. So we tested the strength of bricks at the laboratory of the university, Makalele University there. So it shows the weakness and instability as structure members. So we came up with an idea to using them as formwork of reinforced concrete and also finishing materials. And uh, how we transferred the design to the local people is, so we prepared many physical models and drawings, and more importantly, both or either of us stayed at the site to communicate with local builders. So it was what we learned from the experience in Indonesia. An architect being on site is an efficient way to us to build a good relationship with all the people working on the site. And another good thing is when we are on site, we ask ourselves many times, what are we doing, or uh, what we should do, or who are we, or some kind of identity questions. So it's a kind of a training to get confidence or struggle to get confidence during the long construction process. And in 2015, finally the dormitory completed and opened. So exposed brick wall were realized in its geography right on the equator. And through the process of selection and piling bricks, um, masons, workers develop a kind of pride for local bricks that they had thought no value. And what made this possible is our outsider's view. Once we had lost it, we could find essential elements amongst usual, ordinary things. And we were satisfied with what we had done, but we wanted to do something new or more actively. So in 2015, before the completion of the dormitory, we organized a workshop. 
So we, we thought a workshop would be a nice to see uh, exploring what is possible in a different context. And through our experience in Indonesia, Uganda, and in Japan, we were convinced that the building something in a place with many constraints, like Uganda, the place we had our project, may be a good opportunity to redefine those constraints as essential elements or essential regionalism, which strengthen the outcome. So the process of the workshop, two days research, two days discussion from design, and three days construction, so nothing is special on its schedule, but two characteristic things we let students do. So one is to draw sketches, and even Ugandan students have smartphones with high resolution cameras, but we let them draw sketches on the first day of observation. So one sketch at the center of this image is a little bit above. So close to the ground, there are vegetables with earth like tomato and carrots, and middle of the kiosk, there are leafy vegetables in vivid color to attract buyers. And spices are hung with strings above, and some chickens are in the cage underneath the seller's chair not to escape. And above them, there is a corrugated roof offering shade against deterioration. So those were analyzed when they drew, they drew them, and those kiosks are very ordinary, very everyday building, and so, um, so so many is there. So, but drawing sketches is a good way to make you cool down and keep your way a little bit away from what you are looking at. And another characteristic thing is, I think, uh, to open the team to local. So this kind of small scale kiosk can be fabricated by themselves but we let them to find someone or some places to do each progress, like uh, cut a ply board, uh, cut steel pipes, assemble parts, and so on. So they didn't bring their technique, but ideas how to make. So I think this is what we are doing. So our small firm makes more people involved and make a team bigger. So as a consequence, many people participate in the long process of architecture. So the final images show an ongoing project in Uganda. So this picture shows the carpenters, masons, gatekeepers, and also intern students, quantity severe, all are participating in this project. So six years have passed since we established our firm. This kind of network is what we also have established. So these people are whom we met at the previous project. So we are happy that new clients have seen or heard about how we were involved in the process and have visited the buildings we have designed. So now our firm is involved in some project in Uganda and some in Japan. So there are commercial facility like this, it's this uh, Japanese restaurant, and educational facility and private houses. It all varies in scale and program. So though our physical office is in Tokyo, the number of projects in Uganda is increasing recently. So now our challenge is to figure out the proper sites for our firm. We are planning to hire more staff because the number of the project is increasing, but we want to keep the smallness of our firm. So why we want to keep our smallness is, firstly, we started our practice from the very small library, which was within 70 square meter. We both love to think about small spaces, though the scale becomes bigger. And secondly, we want to dedicate our time to be on site. So this is for working with communities and for us to be more involved in the projects. So we think we are working to feel that we involve in the whole process. So this is a kind of this is our satisfaction. So um, at the end of this presentation, so when we work transnationally, so we want to keep in mind two things. So one is being balanced in re respecting the local identity while maintaining our own identity to help our outsiders view, and also being balanced in collaboration with local people. Thank you. Great, thank you. The third practice of this panel, Ingrid Moye and Christoph Seller from Mexico City.
So thank you for the invitation. Again, um, we would like to talk a bit about the way we work, as others do or have done already. Um, as you said, Juan, at the beginning, um, it's an intellectual exercise to establish a practice. And uh, we were obviously at the same uh, challenge at the beginning, and we decided, um, being actually in, in a condition of working for, an, for a practice at the time, how do we find out that how we work together and, and how well we work together, apart from the fact that we work together in that firm, but how do we work together as authors? Um, so we um, decided to do a series of case studies to test ourselves, and um, these are just the first two that we did, uh, like a house, a tower, and other typologies. Um, so for the house, uh, we set ourselves a fictional plot. Um, in this case, it's actually a lake in Mexico, and um, we decided to do a house along that lake. Um, in this case, it is, as you can see, that, that the house actually becomes a little lake, and it, you know, the roof is the swimming pool and all of this, so it reflects the surrounding. I um, don't want to go more into detail. Um, the second uh, case study is for a tower. Um, and of course, we, are, we were each time exploring the, um, uh, the, the borders of that typology. So in this case, this was, again, a fictional plot. So we were extruding uh, a certain territory into a tower shape that then uh, led us to also thinking the tower differently. So for example, the, the core gets split up into individual um, necessary elements and you obviously achieve something else than if you already have a brief to work from. And, yeah. Another key element for us in, in our office that didn't, we didn't plan this, but it happened as we developed the office, is uh, um, the collaboration aspect. We've been collaborating with different people, not just the typical things like engineers, of course, landscape uh, architects, etc. But we're, we've been collaborating a lot with artists. Um, we, we didn't have this in mind at the beginning, but uh, it's something we've been doing for more than four projects, I guess, in the office. And um, for example, this is a project that we completed last year in Bristol, in England, and it's a collaboration with a Scottish artist called Katie Patterson. And um, this is just to show you a little bit of the process. Um, basically, the, the image on the right is the built final image, and the one on the left is an image of the 3D model that we did in Mexico. Um, of course, we work in many ways with sketches, with drawings, with 3D models. But for example, in this case, we were, we had to work very precise. I mean, in a way, when we work on projects in different continents, we sometimes have to develop actually rather a lot of work uh, in the office to be to control and to understand as much as we can of the project and to communicate it as best to the other side of the world. So the communication with the, with the artist was very much through Skype. Of course, we went there many times, but um, so that's why we developed this very detailed um, model where we, um, for example, this is a kind of grotto space where we had more than 10,000 species of woods and each individual piece of wood had to be modeled and accommodated. So it was a very refined and delicate work um, that we then had to translate. And luckily, we got a really um, good team and a very good communication. So we managed to make the, pro make the project almost one to one. Um, and this is just to show you a little bit of the, the sketches that we showed through Skype and through emails to communicate on one side with the artists, with the University of Bristol, where, where the project was, was done. And um, yeah, to communicate even uh, what wood would go where. And even on site, we would be um, taking Skype with the phone and communicating ourselves. Um, to tell you a little bit about the project, just quickly, it's a... Um, it's an, permanent artwork um, in Pavilion in the University of Bristol in England. And the commission was to host or to show a collection of wood of more than 10,000 different species. And we decided together with the artists to generate a kind of grotto space where you would exhibit the wood and a person would go in and um, look at all these um, species. Then um, this is another uh, project where we had a collaboration with an artist. This is um, an open competition, international competition that we entered 
and we won the first prize together with an artist, a German artist, Albert Weiss, a very good friend of us. And uh, this is a, a memorial for Martin Luther. It's in the center of Berlin, just behind Alexander Platz. And um, also something important to mention is the collaborations we've been doing with artists are not um, as in some cases that the artist conceptualizes a work and then he asks the architect to de develop the, the piece. In these cases, the artists have been, in our opinion, perhaps a little bit overwhelmed with the scale of certain projects. And they've approached us because perhaps we're close friends or in the case of Katie Patterson, they just found our work interesting or I don't know. But so they've approached us to conceptualize a project, which, is, which has been a really interesting thing for us to not start a project just thinking as, as an architect, but conceptualizing it um, intellectually together with the artist and then developing the project. Um, so in this case, for example, we're developing this uh, memorial that is public space and is integrating um, light. And in a, so in this case, we're working with um, high technology, developing new technology ha to have these LED fields in the floor um, to have certain messages and quotes in relation to Luther's work. I won't explain you all the project because it's quite complex, but just that you get, get glimpses of, of the project. Um, this is another case of a collaboration that um, two weeks ago we, we won first prize again. Um, in this case, it is for the um, University of New, Me New Mexico State, New Mexico State University, sorry. Um, and this was an open con competition again to enter with art. It was more an art um, competition. We entered together with an artist from Berlin. She's called um, Sarah Schoenfeld. And in this case, we had to design a piece, an element that would go into the technological laboratory. Um, they call it like that, it's like a computer lab. And they, had, they gave us this wall, this large wall, where we had to put an artwork there. And we, we, in discussions with the artists, we decided to, to use the information or the knowledge of the university that is put in the hard disks. So we are actually melting the metal of inside the hard disks, and we're impregnating some plates with this knowledge or with this metal. And with these, we create this open um, field of vision in, in the space. So we play with the reflections to make new networks of co communication and links within the laboratory. Um, yeah, as a next uh, point, perhaps it's interesting to talk about the process, how we um, tackle a design or a tackle a uh, task to 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 um, for an installation for for a building. In this particular case, this is a, sc a screenshot of various models uh, showing actually from the top left um, for a, a museum building for Mexico City. So how we start uh, first with a massing, of course. I mean, this is something you're very familiar with, I imagine, but then obviously uh, through the breaking down, through the brief, etc., getting narrower and narrower towards a proposal, different ideas coming in, shapes start again from, from, from another direction, etc., until you actually uh, arrive at the bottom right at the proposal um, that then in this particular case is a multifaceted uh, layered building that sits within a green park, so that's why it has this um, extensive outdoor areas, terraces, although it has an, a recessed uh, core, a glazed core of exhibition space, but we really wanted to push here also the typology of your museum, how you exhibit, how you use a museum, because we were um, in the context of a park, so we said let's use also the outside, of course this is for Mexico City, you have a moderate climate throughout the year, so you can actually do that. Especially for me as a European, this is a very exotic approach, uh, um, and I found this uh, very uh, interesting to, to play with. Um, the next project is a park with some buildings that um, we also entered a competition, an invited competition this year. Um, and uh, uh, we, we won the proposal. So what you're seeing here is a 26,000 square meter park in the middle of Guadalajara. Um, and um, this is a new development or whatever is white is actually getting built right now. It's one of the largest developments in uh, Latin America at the moment. Um, and the park itself is um, 
a collaborative process with lots of different parties. So in this particular case, we um, worked actually with um, Arab, the engineers, uh, with the group that we still knew from our work at Herzog Dimeron. So with the same group, um, we actually collaborate on several projects. Um, and in this particular case, we did together as authors the design. And um, instead of just providing a um, inhabitable green space, we actually asked ourselves what is a park um, in the sustainable uh, matter and how could you design a park sustainable or is a park in itself already sustainable because it's just growing by itself. Or, so um, we figured actually a park is almost like a building, it has to be maintained, it's very difficult to, to realize um, and in this case we actually incorporated the for example, the stormwater design in the form of a dry riverbed that then gets flooded at times and it contributes to the landscape. So this is like a miniature version of Mexican landscapes, of course, local plants, local species, etc. But um, the engineering is inherent in the uh, proposal and this gives you a glimpse of the complexity of it. So the park itself obviously you know, grows, also dies off certain parts, we create biomass. And uh, with the biomass, we uh, fuel also the cooling of the auditorium, which is underground. So this whole thing becomes a very complex system that is the, tries to be um, a benchmark ecological project as a park together with public buildings. And this could only be possible in the collaboration with engineers, of course, because we uh, don't have the in-depth knowledge. And obviously, the engineers themselves couldn't do it themselves just like that either. So it's only the the joint effort that makes this happen. Um, these are photos of um, another project that we're doing actually, uh, which was mentioned before in Kurdistan in Iraq, um, the Kurdish part of Iraq, uh, which is obviously at the moment um, sadly uh, has other problems than uh, constructing buildings. Um, and nevertheless, this is an ongoing process for several years. Uh, we got the commission by a German NGO in 2013 to do a memorial in the middle of a desert. Um, the memorial is for a genocide that Saddam Hussein committed on the Kurds in 1988, it's called Anfal. Uh, and we were commissioned to do a proposal for a memorial. So what you see here is actually the ongoing conversation, the, the, the constant convincing of various parties. On the top, for example, uh, is a meeting in Berlin at the foreign ministry because they are supporting the project. Um, on the left, more different delegations coming to Germany, us going to Kurdistan. Um, since this is also a bottom-up project, we are um, working obviously very closely with the uh, clients, which in this case are the survivors, uh, mainly women, um, in their 50s, 60s. Uh, so you see a picture here in the, in the middle. Um, and uh, doing lots of um, political agitation almost towards the project um, to make it happen. So we find ourselves as architects, actually as the authors of a, of a proposal in the middle of this process and in order to make this happen we have to participate in this, uh, otherwise it would not work and it would not uh, make a step further. And this is actually the proposal. Um, it's worked around an uh, artwork that we arrange in a circle, it's photographs of the survivors. And uh, in the middle we have this message in a way that obviously symbolizes to start with the void, but then grows into a um, park or into a garden that's alive, into a new landscape as a signal of hope perhaps. And all the program is developed around it, around the ring. Um, as there is archives, uh, galleries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, something that is really important for in a practice for every project, even if it doesn't matter if it's in Mexico or abroad, the scale of the project, it's been the materialization of the projects. And with this, I mean that we we have a very carefully. Uh, careful um, development of the project since the beginning, since the conceptual phase, but we are very interested in how we translate that information into the realization. Um, and, and we achieve this, or we try to achieve this, through um, understanding as much as we can of the project through the architectural means that we have, that are drawings, um, and 3D models, other types of softwares, etc., but also being on site 
even if it's on Me in Mexico or in any other countries, we, we see it in the same way. And uh, we're very interested also in um, working with projects that perhaps don't have the largest budgets. And uh, for example, we are an office with, that are, is not so interested in selecting materials from a catalog that many other offices might do, and we of course do, but we like very much the idea of rethinking the materiality of the projects, very specific to each one. And this is, for example, a um, very small showroom that we designed in Mexico City, and we had a very small budget, and we decided to use very simple materials that are coming rather from factories or, or that are um, used for other things, not necessarily for what we are um, designing. And, and this gives us a lot of room to play and to, and to design. Um, this is, for example, a house that we completed beginning of this year, in, also in Mexico City. And here we worked, uh, we were very interested in integrating um, craftsmanship, of course, I mean, Mexico, this is one of the things we have, we have and we, we love to use. And we, we designed this floor that is used, is used inside and outside the house is the same surface. And we worked with local marble to create this kind of terrazzo that is um, kind of like playing with the landscape and, and with the house itself. And we also develop, for example, this, this object or this product that we are, it, it's a standard uh, clay brick or block and we are applying a kind of art artisanal or, or craftsmanship um, work to it that is this, this uh, metallic cladding and we're developing with, together with some um, lo local craft cra uh, craftsmanship in Guadalajara or near Guadalajara actually. Um, so we're developing a kind of catalog of this um, blocks and we're trying to generate a product that can, that can be sold also in stores, same as when you buy the, the standard block, but having this additional local value um, and people can use it for anything they want. It's not just for our projects, but we're trying to bring this out in the market. And this is, for example, a project in, well, it's coming out from a project we did in San Galen. It's a exhibition design we were commissioned to do uh, this year. Um, it was for the Textile Museum in St. Gallen, and it was an exhibition on technology of textiles. And we were commissioned to design all the exhibition, but also including all the furniture. So we developed a catalog of objects that were tables, um, um, plinths, walls, etc. And we, we thought that the material of these objects had to be related to the technology of textiles. So we actually found a product that just came out to the market that is a concrete, a fabric concrete. So it's a mix of, of certain fibers that is made into a con concrete, uh, very thin plate that we were able to work with as if it was a fabric. So, I mean, I won't go into detail of how, how it works, but the point is that we were able to make these almost uh, draped shapes and, and objects that looked like fabrics and were as thin as fabrics, but were very strong and we were able to put very large, heavy objects on top of. So, um, this exhibition um, is still ongoing. And then um, we, for example, this is an, a small shop we did in Mexico City. It was a very limited budget, one of the first projects we, we did actually, and a very complicated existing space. So we, we liked and enjoyed very much this, this um, um, experience of working uh, with very, very few means. And we decided to use, for example, local wood to create a skin that will allow us to let some light into the space to also have certain views outside and let some views in every now and then. And we worked also with um, local craftsmanship to, to use copper. We selected copper as a metal that we will use all throughout the store. And yeah, it's, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was really interesting. Um,
It's also always interesting to, you know, group people around themes as broad as, you know, transnational or, um, and obviously you're quite varied in your practices and approaches, but I'm going to try to sort of thread commonalities, um, maybe more in the attitude rather than in the work, and uh, try to be somewhat po polemical so that we can extract <clears throat> some, some kind of reflection. Um, clearly, I think uh, all of you, and, and I would say probably um, will find uh, throughout the day that whatever that division between local and global, we're much beyond that now and everybody is operating in a very networked, very informed, very agile way. Um, but, but I think it's interesting to figure out um, how uh, that um, is, is possible rather than just claim that we're beyond that. Um, I would say that there is maybe uh, um, a, a sense of retreat uh, that one finds in the, in the, let's say, how you've articulated or positioned the practices. I mean, if I think of you know, the 80s or, or the kind of retreat into academia that happened here in the US where the world was moving too fast or there was a kind of sense of the commercialization or for whatever reason there was a kind of return to the disciplinary that happened really within the walls of academia. Uh, it seems to me that if I lo just look at the three practices, there is a kind of retreat, but that's different, right? It's either retreating. It's just interesting that at the moment where we're still talking and we're still experiencing you know, global urbanization, high-speed uh, transformation, issues of migration, yet like all these climate change, your uh, position is we're going to work in a small rural village uh, and build a library, or we fell in love with Mumbai. And I mean, just hearing you speak, there was a kind of, I, I was thinking about slow food. There was like, our resistance <laughs> is that we're, we're just going to learn to eat again, actually, and take pleasure in the taste. Or, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I think you, in, in your case, you're a little bit more, more in between, but nevertheless, there's a kind of radical, there's a choice, well, we're, we're, you know, we may not be in a rural village, but we're gonna work in Mexico, which is extremely dense and exciting, but still, you know, there's, the, there's a kind of hybrid, uh, uh, you know, possibility. So, so that there's a kind of sense of retreat. Um, there's obviously, and this is, this is maybe more the result of the, the time uh, of the practice versus, which is, uh, which is the engagement with scale. Small is good. You know, small is another form of resistance or, or um, I think that, you know, if REM still like, you know, pose the question of scale as the fundamental problem for architects for the future, you're like, nope. No, actually really, <laughs> we, we're, not, we're not so interested. Um, and, and I wanna kind of open that up a little bit. Craft, craft is definitely a way to move beyond the local and the global, right? Reconnecting with making and materiality and how things are made and whether you're engaging with kind of uh, uh, the labor uh, as part of the design process or, or local materials or finding materials or, you know, that craft is the way out of that issue. And, and uh, but there's also then as a result of craft, Craft becomes, it seems to me, takes the place of history in that the only history that's interesting is the context, the climate, how things are made. It's the vernacular history, not the disciplinary history. There's no, nobody, none of you mentioned, besides having worked at another practice before, there isn't the sense of a legacy historically. Uh, of, of engaging, and again, I'm, I'm being very polemical here, but, and there's a kind of, well, we're, we're starting from scratch a little bit, and we're kind of relearning the basics. Um, collaboration, of course, is critical, I think, um, and, and it's, you know, the more minds come together, uh, the better it is, and I, I see that, you know, it's very interesting to see it in our Students, I would say that 10 years ago, maybe students wanted to work individually, and now they actually seek to work 
in teams and there is a kind of complete shift of how the creative process happens. And, uh, but, but I was very intrigued by the fact that collaboration doesn't mean, oh, we have to collaborate with only local artists so that we can, no, it's like, that's my network, you know, we need color, we're gonna, and so there's a kind of lack of self-consciousness, which I think is very um, refreshing. And <clears throat> there is a sense, nevertheless, that the practices are also operating somewhat as art practices. I mean, because of the scale, the engagement with the materiality, with making, with you know, being on site, you were also saying being on site, and there's this kind of re-engagement, and as a result, I, you know, before um, uh, before Ingrid and and Christoph, I was going to say also no competitions. Like if there was a gener two generations ago, it was all defined by competitions, and I know you you're entering competitions, so I'm so I'm going to change that from no competition to very little speculative work. You know, you're not spending your time thinking through speculation, thinking through questions of representation. The model is a tool to build. It's not uh, an object that is architecture in itself. So in, in that sense, for me, it's also a kind of rejection of a whole historical moment that, you know, claimed uh, representation as the object of architecture, almost. Um, and um, process versus product. It, we're, we're, I mean, I know that it's also the theme of the, of the day is to think about the process, but, uh, you know, it, it's, there's no, the, you are a little bit more object oriented, but you are very, all of you very process oriented and, and part of the pleasure is, is, in, the, is in the process. Um, uh, but, but nevertheless, the idea of, of realization is really key. So th these were my sort of reflection on if we took three, you know, of, of uh, groups to, to think through. Um, and so I guess the, the big questions for me are, what would you agree that there's a sense of retreat or, you know, like is, is the choice of operating at a certain scale or in a certain place, is that really a choice or is it actually a result of losing so much agency that the only place we can actually act is in a rural village in Uganda as architects because we no longer are at the table of big decisions that are shaping our cities, you know. So is, is, that, is that an active kind of finding a site of agency or is it more like we have really very little space to go? Um, uh, and so that would be my first question. And related to that is the question of scale. Um, um, I remember Andres Lepic, maybe some of you know, uh, you know his, uh, which, uh, his um, uh, small, small, uh, small scale big change at MoMA, which was a show that he did in, I think, 2010, which kind of was, was really interesting. Um, but is that true, it, you know, is, is, is does, does small imply big? And is that even important that we engage with those you know, big issues of, of, of scale? So, and then the third, so, so the first is the question of retreat and agency. The second is the question of scale. Um, and the third would be this, this uh, sense of your engagement with the discipline and its history, whether that's even relevant or interesting, or whether there's a kind of in a way, very modernist kind of rediscovery of, well, let's just learn how to build again with what we have, where we are, for certain needs, and, and there's a kind of freshness in that act of moving away from um, a kind of critical introspection of the discipline. Perhaps I start. Um, in regards to scale, I would say, um, the moment you start your practice, obviously there isn't often a choice. You know, it's like, I don't know if I speak for everyone, but in our case, it was literally like that. We had to also see what comes up. And um, it's not that we say we don't want to do big buildings. I think we are very open. We have, it's, a, it's a dynamic process also how to build a practice. Um, I don't think that, for, I speak for, for, for us now, of course, uh, there's something uh, bad about large scale. Um, there's nothing fantastic about small scale. Both exist, and I think, um, in our practice, what we didn't show maybe so much was also we do very small scale up to the door mm -hmm. lever. We design, and this is something that we can do in Mexico because of the craftsmanship that was mentioned, because of the possibilities that 
are based on the fact that people have a very uh, economic labor rate um, to, to work, which is impossible in Europe. I mean, this is high-end luxury, what we're talking, if you do a similar thing. Um, and uh, from that perspective, I think it happens that right. we work in small scale. Um, we are also growing. I mean, you saw one competition sure, sure. in our park, so actually it's jumping quite a lot from various scales. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's in a way. But I would say, and I want to hear everybody, I would say though that you could be working on small scale but speculating on big scale. And, but speculation is not something, maybe the question of scale is more interesting in terms of the question of speculation, whether speculation in your practices is something that, that is important. Um, Yeah, I think for us, uh, I would mirror that, that it, it sort of uh, came about, you know, you, you sort of take what, what comes to you. The first project we got was the school, which is, for me, the largest project I've ever worked on. It's it's 200,000 square feet. It's a four-acre campus. Uh, it's also still the largest project that we've done so far. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and it's pretty large. I mean, yeah. I'm not... Well, what, but in terms of, uh, you know, the size of it and duration, at the same time, we're working on, you know, we made these small brass uh, dias that we did in two weeks. And so at the same, while that's happening, we're working on something that is going to take 10 years. And, yeah, I think for us, uh, we've always been, and I don't want to speak for Anna, but I've always been very interested in the process leading to something that's physically manifested. So mm -hmm. the, the notion of speculation is just, I think, personally been something that I haven't pursued. Sure. But uh, yeah, I think that engagement in, in, there's a richness in that engagement of process of making that was something that mm -hmm. we yeah, sort that's of very chased. Clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, now that you speak about process, and this was not specifically a question, but you touched the point. I think to, to me, and perhaps I talk for, uh, um, from both of us, is one of the things that I found most difficult in the practice is to convince clients, which can be people, uh, person, individuals, or government, or institutions, to convince people or to make them understand of the architectural process. And with this, I don't speak just about Mexico. I really see this as a problem everywhere. And it's, it's the value that, or, 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 or the work that is behind the final product that they see that they normally cannot understand. Mm -hmm. And for us, coming from practices where process is really important, we worked for Herzog and Moron and Sana, both of us, where the process was a key element of, of, of design and there would be a lot of time spent on the, on the design process. And then when you open your own practice, you are willing to go on with this very analytical process. And then you face clients that tell you, okay, you have three weeks, but you need to do two models, five panels, um, blah, 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 blah. No? So the time that you have to make, to produce that work is being eaten. Mm -hmm. And where, where is your design process left? Mm -hmm. So. This is something that has been taking a lot of effort and a lot of time to convince clients, government, and institutions on, on, on this intellectual process that is very difficult to grasp or to, to, to understand the, the real value of this. So, so for us, uh, the process of the, I mean, the, let me talk about the scale. Yeah. yeah. So that we just started at the, the opportunity to, to design the small library. But uh, I think uh, the, the scale is relating to the, how can I say, the, the opportunity. Just, you know, uh, because now there is small, there are so many small, the, the project in also Uganda. But uh, for, for us, like young architects, I think compared to the Japan and Asia, there are few architects like us. So I think there are some opportunity to get the more, the bigger scale. But for uh, when we look at the, the process of our design, I think uh, there is no so big difference for us because now the, 
that we also see the small scale of the, the details and the project. So yes, uh, of course there is the different scale of the, the project, but the four hour process is be the same, more, almost same as, as Arctic. So it's, an, <clears throat> it's finding more opportunity, whether there's kind of access to labor in Mexico that's skilled that or whether you can really engage with making and I, so making is really sort of a, a, a key kind of um, I mean perhaps for us uh, what we find uh, uh, interesting in living in a way in both worlds yeah. because we also come from both sure. worlds English Mexican I'm German but um, we we do operate from Mexico but we do operate from there also two other parts right. of the world and vice versa and right. Anyway, we've worked in various different companies and various different continents, even various different cultures. So we have our network also spread out. So when I was mentioning that we work with Arab, it's because it's almost the first engineer I, I would call up if I have a question and they sit in London and because I used to work with them for eight years. So this is a, it's a natural reflex almost. And I think this is perhaps one, we are one of the first generations to experience this, that we have these networks that are not just local, but actually glo global. And um, how can you actually um, execute work with such a network when you're a specialist as you are? I think you were saying no, that you have a landscape architect in New Zealand, but you work you know, for India. And this is something totally um, common for us and natural for us. Yeah, no, I think it's been, it's been common for, for some time. I think the, maybe the difference is choosing to move to a place mm. where access to, you know, where you might have more opportunities or, you know, uh, ver, you know versus, um, you know, it's not so easy to just move to Uganda mm. or to decide Mumbai is going to be the place from which I'm, I'm going to operate because I love it. Like that's a, a next step of saying mm. I, I could actually be anywhere. Um, and and learn, right? Yeah, for sure. But I, w I would say to the students out there, I mean, I, I had no, I went to Mumbai as a grad student. I had no preconception of what it would be or what I would find there or what, what I would study or who I would end up working with. And so it really was a sort of, I don't want to say an, an easy transition, but it was something that was quite intuitive and it just sort of, at every point that I had to decide to, to go or stay or come back or do something else, it just sort of felt natural to, to continue on that path. And so in, in that sense, it, it sort of was easy in a way that I, I think it wasn't, you know, a couple of generations ago, the connectivity, relationships with family, things like that is, is, is quite seamless now, yeah, I think. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. I think it's also interesting, um, I mean, to, to, the, to the sense of, uh, you know, acceleration uh, that Ingrid, uh, you've been talking about, I think that uh, yeah, there was a time when architects had more time uh, and, uh, and now we have less time. And so it's interesting for me, those of you who, or even in the previous panel, those who teach and use the kind of academic um, sort of space as the space of research to, to think through some of the problems so that you can actually operate within the the shorter time or practices that, this is where the speculative part I was interested in because often we no longer are able to speculate with the projects that are, that were given, we speculate with, with other projects and, and then they, the ideas kind of come back into the, I have three weeks to make a model. Um, I mean, in, in your case, I, I think that was, that's kind of interesting. but. But I think you guys are making a very different choice, which is, you know, very much engaged in, in the kind of building process as the practice um, itself, um, which which is quite, you know, quite interesting. And in that case, I would say, um, how would you then reflect on architectural education today in terms of preparing, um, you know, the students or our graduates to? Uh, you know, if representation is no longer really the site of investigation, because all, what we do here is we draw, right? I mean, it, it's not that we, we, we're making, but it's not that the kind of one-to-one -one scale. I mean, would you, would you advocate for an architectural education that is re-engaging construction as kind of fundamental to architecture or building practice or... I'm just curious whether your experience now would kind of shape how you would think about an architectural education. 
Um, I don't like. I studied in Delft, and like the part of like the construction part of, yeah, of it's very strong in there. Uh, yeah, but also the very different way than how we practice uh -huh. now. And uh, but what is very strong is uh, like we had a huge model making mm -hmm. workshop, and so this this the, the making part of architecture, whether that's maybe not so much in how it's actually being built, but just the physical act of making models, mm -hmm. which also trains or helps you as a student to understand how things are built. That was very strong, and I think that's... Uh, both of us have also been involved in teaching in Mumbai, where we try to, to um, like, uh, have students also work in that way, and trying to uh, not only think about ideas on uh, paper sure. or conceptualize it, but also about how, how to it's being made. It. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, I was great at the uh, Tokyo University of the Arts, so the, there was the watercolor painting for the entrance examination. So they finished it, but it was nice to uh, redefine the drawing sketches or the, the pictures, so to communicate with the local laborers. Mm -hmm. That was wonderful, because I didn't realize it before I brought three brave students from Japan to Uganda to have that kind of workshop. Mm -hmm. But they drew well, and also they, it's kind of the analyzing the observation of that site. So that kind of things uh, that make us rethink about that, that, how to communicate or how we think our ideas. So that was interesting for us. Right. Mm. I think the drawing is still very relevant. I think it's key. Um, and coming back to the subject transnational, um, we experienced that we actually have to plan almost more than if we were in the place where mm -hmm. we are constructing. Um, it's, a, it's a form of communication, of course. Uh, in the case of the, um, the wooden grotto, it, it was literally that we decided to make a 3D model in one-to-one. -one. Of course, we could have taken a different approach, let it happen mm -hmm. random, but it is perhaps not our way to do this also. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there, it was too complex what we wanted to achieve, so we really decided to uh, go very much into the detail. Mm -hmm. um, of course, with the local testing, etc. but I would say that this uh, is still very relevant um, and it will become perhaps, or hopefully even more relevant. Uh, um, I would also include the model making, all these abstract forms of representation of trying out, rather than um, just the one-to-one, -one, because sure. the one-to-one -one is purely the local, I think. Right. Right. How do you do the the one to one, five hundred kilometers sure. away? Sure. I think the, you need a, a tool to to it's going control to gradient that of or to scales arrange of it. Making. I think so. Maybe we have time maybe for one one question. Uh, first of all, congratulations on wonderful work, uh, all of all of the groups. Uh, so a common thread between all of you is that you have kind of you have grown up in, in, in more developed countries and I would say more of a structured uh, cultures or societies and have gone back to or gone to a different culture where the way of work is a lot more organic. Uh, the kind of from economy wise uh, countries are more developing. Uh, so I'm curious to know what are the biggest advantages that you have going from this world to that world, and what are the biggest disadvantages that you faced? Uh, in the, it, perhaps just one that you could all pick. Uh, and second question, which is unrelated, is uh, <laughs> do you have a fear of this uh, kind of transition uh, weaning off in a time, uh, or having a much stronger pull towards your roots and will you be able to kind of go back to wherever you came from and be, um, have you ever thought of it? Just curious. Well, sorry, if I could speak to the first one and I think it also ties back to your, some of your questions. One of the things, I don't, I don't know if it's an advantage or disadvantage, but one of the things that we're very strongly aware of in practicing in, in India is that the idea of the profession of architecture really only came with the British. It only arrived, it's only been there for 100, 150 years, whatever that history is. And 
but at the same time, we work with carpenters who are 60th generations, fathers, 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 we're all carpenters. And the tacit knowledge and the opportunity to sort of work with that skill for us is both an unbelievable opportunity, but it's also humbling in the sense that we, we rely on them and, and, and we learn from them and we, we incorporate their sort of expertise into what we do and, and it, it just sort of, I think one of the things we've learned very quickly is that if we can find, again, those people that share values, you can really exponentially amplify what it is you're trying to, to create in the physical world. Uh, when you sort of incorporate those kinds of uh, really rich and, and deep histories, which I think, again, it's this, this conflict of academia versus uh, what I would call tacit knowledge, that as long as you sort of a agree socially that, that you're trying to sort of swim in the same direction, um, it's a really sort of yeah, powerful, not just experience in, in relationship to the process, but also what can be created out of that. And um, for example, speaking of myself, um, I was raised and mainly educated in Mexico and then moved away for more than five years between Spain, Tokyo, Switzerland, England, and then moved back to Mexico. And this was a deliberate decision. We actually quit the the paradise you know from working in a you know like an amazing company in Switzerland and you know having a really nice life etc and going back to um, my own country and the surprise when I moved there was that a lot of my colleagues and friends were really against the idea of me moving back to Mex like moving back this idea of going back which for me was the, total, the opposite thing for me was um, I saw there an opportunity and, and I wanted strongly to go there. So this is something that they never understood and I, 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 am strongly, I strongly believe in that it was the right decision to, to base our office there. And I think what, what it has given me the, the time that I was abroad is that I think I'm able to see the reality in Mexico in a more neutral way where I'm not so, um, let's say, not so, I don't see it in a, perhaps in such a romantic way of idealizing the, 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 the historical, very strong background, and, but to see it in a more neutral way. And I think I'm able to better understand the, the balance between pros and cons, I think. And because I think that in the moment you are away and you, you kind of give value to a lot of things from your own country, or this is at least what I, what I do. But at the same time, I think I'm able to see a lot of um, uh, disadvantages. And, and I think the, the way I try to work with this is to stay quite flexible. So, of course, I mean, I'm, you know, I have a German partner where we worked in Japan and in Switzerland. We know how to do waste in a certain way, but we need to stay very flexible and kind of fluid to, to work with a place like Mexico, or, which doesn't work like that necessarily. So it's been a challenge. It, it, it is always a challenge, but um, yeah, go on. Uh, what I found very um, enriching is, and I think your observation is very true, that you're saying you're, we are going to a very dynamic or a place with a very different dynamic. This is certainly true. Uh, coming from Germany when you, and coming back to the competitions, when you want to enter competitions, you find you're just not able to do it because you haven't have the history of mm -hmm. two years of you know earning two million, turnover two million a year, and Ten, and so forth. No? So you basically find yourself kind of outside. And it, I think that's really a problem in Europe, mm -hmm. honestly. I think mm -hmm. there's, I mean, Switzerland, for example, has already a better system allowing young practices also to participate in the process. Uh, Germany is very bad in this, I think, and many other European countries too. Um, and we saw, obviously, coming from that perspective, a very different dynamic in, in Mexico, very different expectations also. Um, uh, which we enjoy. Likewise, from seen from the Mexican perspective, we have also projects in, in, in Europe, in, in Germany, let's say, and we almost um, uh, um, come with a Mexican approach to these projects. Like, can we now try something else? Think beyond the box. Don't think just in products. Um, 
specify products, the door, the wood, the I don't know, think in what is the wood, you know, what's sure. and, and, and to, to itemize it then again. And I think that's in a way the, the nice symbiosis that we're finding that it influences both perspectives and both sides. Oh, all the work actually is affected somehow that we're doing regardless where it is. So just so that makes me think that actually in some ways the, the architectural practice is more like an art practice in that artists always have kind of immigrated to, to you know, whether they went to Berlin when New York became too expensive or, you know, there's a sense of finding the place where you can actually start to, to engage in the ways that you can engage. And of course, architects were always 20 years later. So, you know, it's interesting for me that this, this you know, this maybe is not uh, the retreat I was talking about, but more finding agency in, in the place that you can grow from. Thank you all, it was really interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.